Alain de Baton has already written books on love and sex, religion, Proust, the news, and he's uh, the author of a recent book, or the co-author of a recent book, called Art as Therapy. And we're talking about his idea that art is useful, but there is a sense that art has somehow alienated the masses, that it's... I don't know, in the, in the group of a kind of in crowd. Well, think of the other art forms. Music, you know, ranges from the highest to the lowest. People love it. No one needs to worry about what it's for. But when it comes to, to art, there is a lot of confusion. At one level, things are going well for art. People are going to museums. Uh, there's a lot of interest in, in art. Uh, and yet I think, we allege in this book, that actually a lot of people are very confused and society doesn't know what artists are really for. The last time that we knew what art was about was when in the Western world, um, Christianity was in charge of art. Christianity knew absolutely what art was for. Art was a form of advertising for the lessons of Jesus Christ. Right? It was just it was designed to give luster and charm and seductive power to all those important truths of the Bible. And, and if you're hostile to that, you would call it propaganda. That's right. That's right. But it was propaganda on behalf of sometimes some quite nice things. You know, so Giovanni Bellini was painting an altarpiece in uh, in order to advertise kindness. Uh, and similarly, in Buddhist art. What was Buddhist art? It's exactly the same purpose, to lend luster and conviction to the task of becoming more like the Buddha, of releasing yourself from the engagements with daily life and acceding to the life of uh, the saint, the, the saintly Buddhist figure. And so when we look at a Buddhist sculpture of, of the Buddha, the idea is you look at this sculpture and you try and become a little bit more like the image that is being shown to you. Now, so we've got religion. Religions know what art's about. Art is to help you to become more like what these religions think of as the good person leading the good life. Then in the 19th century, this breaks down totally. And there comes along this phrase, which is such uh, a troublesome and unhelpful phrase. The phrase goes like this. It says that art should be for art's sake. Now, that's you know, that was an attempt to try and separate art out from the more vicious and crude agendas of politics, religions, etc. It was like artists going, get off our backs. Yeah, yeah. I we mean, just want to make art for our sake. Yeah, well, our sake's important, though, because in the 19th century, what happens is the artists say, look, it's not about power. It's not about me being a publicist for the church. It's about my experience. It's about my feelings. My heart leaps up when I behold a rainbow in the sky. Yeah. The problem is, as the viewer, I'm thinking, oh, hang on a minute. Where do I fit into this? Like, what are you doing for me? Now, don't get me wrong. Artists of the, uh, of the 19th century and 20th century have continued to do some great and wonderful and very important work. But the way in which we, the audience, frame those works and understand them is a little bit confused. I think that artists of the 19th and 20th centuries are doing what artists have always done, which is to make... Uh, seductive and interesting and important visions of the really big themes of life from birth to death. Um, so when, you know, Renoir paints you a bowl of peaches, um, this isn't just nothing. It's an attempt to get you to focus on something that he thinks is really important, more important than going to the party, making millions of francs, achieving political office. He is making a political statement in favour of some peaches. So let's look at some of these. Some of the fun You've got seven functions of art. I'm not sure we'll get through all of them, but one of them is remembering. In fact, you start the book with remembering. And uh, you print a lovely very conventional 18th century painting by the French artist Jean-Baptiste Regnaud, uh, which is called The Origin of Painting. And this shows a girl on a sort of balustrade in the garden and her lover is about to leave, her boy lover is about to leave. And so she's drawing his shadow, tracing his shadow on the side of, you say it's a tomb and uh, because he's about to go. And maybe this is the origin of art. Now, what's the use of that work about. Make the case. Well, well, I mean, it's reminding us quite usefully that one of the reasons why we need art is because we forget things. You know this most obviously through your mobile phone. When do you pick out your mobile phone and take a picture? When something beautiful or interesting or significant is going on and you are afraid that you will forget it. And you will. So we need images. The, vi the origins of our interest in the visual is often the desire to capture a moment. Now, the artists we call great are people who are capturing the things that are most significant. What we call a good painting or a good work of art has somehow grabbed onto what seems most significant. But you know, take another art form, Buddhist art. Uh, a lot of Buddhist art is about scrolls where th words are written down. And it might be a word like be compassionate. 
right? So on a huge script, there will be in you know, an 18th century Zen Buddhist scroll, the words compassion, the word be compassionate. Um, and really what that's saying is um, you've got to remember to be compassionate. And unless there's uh, something that will help you to remember on your kitchen wall or uh, you know in the hallway as you're about to go out to town you may forget that and and all art at some level has that memorializing function it's taking important emotions and making them concrete and stable what about the idea that a picture can just be too pretty well, there's a lot of suspicion about prettiness among serious elite people. And whenever um, museums audit which postcards sell well in their galleries, they're often appalled to find that it's the pretty one yes. that sells really well. It's um, flowers in spring. It's little kiddies running through a field. It's a lovely spring day. right? And, and they're very down on it. The elite is very down on this. I'm very sympathetic. Why is this kind of art popular? What does it tell us about human nature? It tells us that all of us have got a lot of darkness within us. A lot of us know the temptations of despair. And we need these images, not because we're you know, happy, clappy, sentimental idiots, but precisely because we know a lot about the darkness in life and we need to balance it out. Two paintings that you used to make this point are a Monet picture of water lilies, just your standard water lily shot, and then a Matisse picture of people dancing around in a ring. That's right. And they look very they very happy, joyful, naked people dancing around in a ring. And, of course, the anxiety of elite people is that they say, well, look, what about Syria? What about the children who are dying in Syria? So there you are with a lovely Matisse of you know people um, are dancing around in, in, in a circle. It all looks very pretty. But what about Syria? To which my answer is we're not in danger of forgetting Syria. We're not in danger of forgetting the darkness. We would have to be extraordinary people who never listened to the news bulletin if we really thought that the world was just a wonderful, happy, cheerful place. As I say, the real danger is not sentimental naivety. The real danger is manic depression. At another point, rather polemically, we say that art is a bucket, um, that each work of art is a bucket. And a bucket was invented to hold water because otherwise we let water run away. And a lot of important emotions we can't hold in our hands. And we need these buckets called art to hold things like hope or empathy or consolation in a safe place so that we'll know where to go when we next need to get in touch with that feeling. You know what I'm finding hard about this? It's the utilitarian uh, interpretation right. of art. So I'm thinking about that moment when I was 18 and I visited the Uffizi for the first time. I walked into a room, I turned my head and there was the Botticelli Venus and its frame was touching the bottom of the floor. So she was the height that I was then. I was looking into the eyes of Botticelli's Venus. I don't know what the use of that was, but I know it's one of the spiritually intense moments in my life. But to say it had a use, I don't know. Right. Okay, so very nice people like yourself sometimes think if we try and pin <laughs> if we try and pin things down a bit too much, it may kill it. That painting, the reason why that painting is so moving is it shows a level of beauty and happiness that is so rare in life. Most of life's really tough. It's got sharp edges. Most of the people we fall in love with are not in love with us. Most of the pretty people don't turn our way, etc. Suddenly, you're seeing through the eyes of Botticelli, you're seeing a glimpse of paradise. Another gallery story. Uh, last year I was in Berlin and um, I went to, I think it was the New National Gallery, and I saw a series of photos of water towers. And I, I was absolutely captivated by this. This is a row of water towers in black and white, stark. I've never seen anything like them. And I'm a bit the Beshers. Yes, yep. I'm a bit of a nut for water towers, oddly. I love a water tower. Um, and here they are in your book. Yeah. So I was so pleased that you also uh, moved and touched by what looked like very severe... You know, studies, documentations of a series of very different concrete water towers. Th th this is interesting because what art does is it makes things glamorous. When something's in a gallery, you think, oh, wow, it's glamorous. It's in a scene through the eyes of art, it makes it glamorous. Now, most of the time, the things that make things glamorous in our society are advertising and the news media. And the kinds of things it glamorizes are, in my view, the wrong things. The new shiny car, the new celebrity film, a new beachside villa that costs, you know, 25 times the national average salary. And then what art can do is it can say, hang on a minute, okay, those things, you know, you think are glamorous. But what about that? What about a water tower? Or what about a couple of lemons standing on a sideboard with a light falling on them in a certain way? That's pretty beautiful too. And what about, you know, some blades of grass by a river on an ordinary day? That's kind of glamorous or, too. Or what about cars, all identical cars lined up on the docks Absolute. waiting to be picked a up and taken away and Absolute. sold? Or, or indeed a computer hard drive, which is beautiful once you open it up and you see the precision with which engineers have designed these so-called everyday things. So a lot 
lot of what artists are doing are rescuing everyday experiences that we unfairly neglect because we are driven by advertising and other things to look for glamour only in certain places. Art can only become meaningful when it accepts that of course it has to want things of us, the audience. It should be propaganda, it should be advertising, but, huge but, on behalf of the most important and intelligent and wise ideas. That's what art is about. And in a world in which we are bombarded with images of the very worst kind of impulses that are given advertising, it seems catastrophic that artists stand back and go, well, we wouldn't want to influence anyone too much. It's like, really? You don't want to influence? You, you're going to let Coca-Cola do all the influencing? You've totally withdrawn? We need art to be propaganda for the good stuff in life. Music